Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's session, The Practice of Policy, Pathways to a Career in Political and Public Policy Work. My name is Chris Pasalnow, and I'm a Senior Portfolio Manager for Fellowships at Equal Justice Works. We are so grateful you are all able to join us today to hear from our fantastic panel. If you'd like to enable closed captioning on your screen, please click the closed captioning option at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions or comments for a panelist during this session today, please type them into the pathable chat box. Our panelists will answer questions towards the end of the session. This session will run from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern time. If you have to leave during part of the session, you can always rejoin by clicking on the name of the session under the event agenda section. This session will be recorded, so if you are unable to rejoin, you will be able to listen to it at a later date. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, Michael Uden. Great. Thank you, Krista. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning, depending on where you all at. Um, I'm Michael Uden. I'm going to be uh, hosting today's session. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Like I said, my name is Michael Uden. I'm a principal. Um, at the Raven Group, we are a public affairs and communications shop here in Washington, D.C. I help lead our government affairs practice group, um, and my specialty in the, in the substantive area of work that I, that I perform is in education and workforce development. Um, take a chance to take a minute here and introduce some of my, my esteemed colleagues. Um, Jen, you want to kick us off? Sure. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. My name is Jennifer Podkol, and I'm the Vice President of Policy and Advocacy at Kids in Need of Defense. We are an organization um, that advocates on behalf of children on the move who become accompanied, unaccompanied or separated uh, from their family members. And I'm a proud EJW alum from 2006. Great. Thanks, Josh. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Joshua Branch. Go by Josh. Um, I'm a policy specialist at the Crime and Justice Institute. Um, we're a criminal justice reform organization that is uh, nonpartisan. Uh, we provide technical assistance to governors, state legislators, uh, the ju judiciary um, on how to decrease their incarceral footprint. Great. Thanks, Josh. Michael. Hi, everyone. I'm Michael Lukens. I am the Associate Director of the Capital Area Immigrants Rights Coalition, or CARE Coalition, as we typically say. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization that does a few things, including providing free legal services to the adults and children that are detained in the general DC region. So Maryland and Virginia, there's 12 government detention facilities. Uh, and in ad addition to that, we have an immigration impact lab that does advocacy, uh, federal litigation and appeals work. And then we have a state advocacy program. Great, thank you. And, and thank you all for joining us today. This is, this is an exciting and important conversation to have. Um, for, for those of us that are watching and participating, we are all lawyers and we have all kind of developed and built our careers into the policy and political arena. Um, so that's what we're really going to talk about today. We're going to talk about how that happened, what are some of the issues and the opportunities that may exist, how do you, and, and essentially how you do that. So that's going to be the, the, the conversation for the next uh, 55 minutes or so. We're going to reserve about 15 minutes at the end for questions and answers. So please make sure that you, uh, you, you participate in that, in, that, in that opportunity. So let's kind of just start, kind of go around the horn. Um, and talk about really what you're doing now, what your work is like, and also how did you get there? I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually start really briefly. I'll kick us off. Um, so like I said a few minutes ago, I'm a, I'm a principal in the Ravens group. In the Raven group. Um, I help lead our government affairs practice group. And what that means is we help our clients who are primarily nonprofit organizations. Mine, I also work with some public agencies and, and our job is to really help them develop and execute their policy agenda. Um, and what that looks like varies from client to client, whether it's helping them develop their policy priorities or they may be already, they already may have those policy priorities in, in place 
and we help them develop a strategy for advocacy and how to advance those policies. Um, I am a lawyer by, train, by training. I uh, graduated from law school in 1991. Um, I litigated for uh, about 10 years with the federal government. My entire career up until this point at Raven was in federal service. Um, so I was a litigator for uh, Department of Labor and Social Security Administration for close to 10 years. I started to evolve into the policy and legislation side of the general counsel's office over there at Social Security Administration. I really fell in love with the with, with that space of policy and legislation, and then trans, uh, moved, made my way to work in the United States Senate. So I worked in the Senate for a good 10 years as a staffer on the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. Um, from there, I had the opportunity to go work um, with the Obama administration at the United States Department of Education, where I became the Assistant Secretary for Special Education and Rehab Services. So I have about 25 years in federal service um, before I, before I uh, came to the Raven Group. Um, let's go backwards. Michael, you want to you wanna tell us a little bit about what you're doing now and, and how you got to this place? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think you're going to hear uh, some overlap between uh, what Jen is working on and what I'm working on, uh, since Kind is one of our uh, friends. And so I'm going to leave a fair amount of, I think, Jen, if this makes sense, the kind of the kids policy work for you to talk to, and I'll focus on the other stuff. So our policy work and the work that I'm involved in it really breaks down into a couple buckets. Uh, the first is about funding. So there is no right to an appointed counsel in immigration court. So if you can't afford an attorney and there's not a nonprofit like KIND, like CARE Coalition there, then you're gonna to go to court without an attorney. And so a lot of our work is at the federal and state level to derive funding for adults in immigration court. And what that looks like at the federal level is a lot of meetings right now with staffers as you know, budget uh, is being worked on and reconciliation, uh, working with partners to drive federal funding. Uh, CARE Coalition takes part in those conversations really providing a on the ground view the conversations we tend to lead are local conversations. So we have been successful in pushing state and local governments to provide funding, uh, both in Maryland, I was gonna say both, in Maryland, Virginia, and DC over the last five years, we've been able to convince the decision makers that this is a good use of government funds. And then on top of that, you know, the during the Trump administration, we were part of a cohort of providers of adult detention services that was constantly pushing back on regulatory changes, on funding cuts, on you know even something as small as when you can access the facility to see your uh, a client. So we were part of that cohort. So we've kind of shifted from defensive to offensive over the last year and a half during the Biden administration. As far as how I got here, I, I have a, I think a slightly different path than you'll hear from Jen and Josh, which is I was at a big law firm for about a decade uh, doing environmental M&A work, doing some environmental policy work, and also running that firm's regional pro bono program. Uh, and I left that position about seven and a half years ago and came to Care Coalition uh, to help run and grow this organization. When I started, there was 14 of us. There's now 96 today. So it's been a, it's been a lot of growth. Um, and I will say it was, you know, I, I left law school as many people did thinking I would go public interest and I ended up at a big law firm. There's pros and cons. I'm sure somebody's going to ask about it later. But that's how I ended up where I am at. Uh, and along the way, got a master's in policy, which has been incredibly helpful along the way. Great. Thank you, Michael. Josh, how about you? Yeah, so um, I work at the Crime and Justice Institute. Uh, I'm a policy specialist there. And um, I mean, my work 
can really fluctuate. Um, currently, right now, I'm working on a project on court appearance and fines and fees in North Carolina. Uh, that project is really hyper local. Um, so working with like three specific counties and working on their local court rules, looking at their local practices. Um, I've also had the opportunity to work on large statewide reforms. Um, so in Michigan, uh, we assisted um, uh, the Pew Charitable Trust uh, and the Michigan legislature and the governor in passing, uh, I think it was like a 22 bill criminal justice reform that touched on things like license revocations, fines and fees, uh, some behavioral health work as well. Um, as to how I got to where I am right now, um, I uh, originally was a teacher. Um, I taught in Miami, Florida for a few years. Um, at my school, there was a school resource officer, which I had never seen um, prior to teaching, who had the ability to arrest students for really simple things like food fights, but labeling that as assault. Um, talking back to like a teacher disorderly like conduct or something like that. Um, and I was like, wow, this is really like ethically horrible. I need to figure out more about this. Um, I went to Georgetown Law where I predominantly focused on education and juvenile justice issues. Um, and I thought at the time that I would sort of intern at Capitol Hill and sort of climb my way up the ladder. Uh, but those experiences sort of showed me that that wasn't necessarily something that I wanted to do. I, I didn't necessarily want to work directly in Capitol Hill, but I wanted to be doing something policy related. Um, and so by the time I was ready to graduate, um, you know, I was doing a lot of these interviews. I did the EJW interviews myself. And the common refrain that I was hearing from public defenders was that if you wanted to get into policy, you had to be a public defender for X amount of years, and then you could get into policy. Um, that seemed to me, um, it just didn't seem like the right route for me, I guess. If someone wants to be a public defender, I feel like you have to really be like bought into public defense and also just really invested in your clients. And I knew, you know, while I was interested in criminal justice work, um, public defense wasn't necessarily for me. Um, I ended up working at the Juvenile Law Center uh, where I worked as a fellow there, a Zubrow fellow there for two years, uh, doing appellate work for um, uh, juvenile life without parolers. And then I also had the opportunity to run a few campaigns in Maryland and in Pennsylvania around juvenile fines and fees. And um, that sort of got me into the policy sphere uh, where I ended up um, in New Orleans um, assisting a small organization called the Justice and Accountability Center of Louisiana uh, to run their campaigns on uh, clean slate reform, um, which is how I ended up being picked by uh, the Criminal Justice Institute. Great, thank you, Josh. How about you, Jen? Sure, so right now my position at KIND, I manage our policy team. So we're about seven people right now. And KIND's policy work is a complement to the on the ground and services that my colleagues are providing. So we have 13 offices around the country where attorneys and paralegals are representing unaccompanied kids in their immigration court proceedings. We also have social service providers who work to accompany the kids, make sure that they have what they need to go through the immigration court process. We also have programs in Mexico and in Europe, um, really looking at you know, what happens to kids during their journey and internationally what's happening to kids who are on the move um, because you know, they weren't safe where they wanted to and they feel like they have to go somewhere else, either for family reunification um, and find permanency somewhere else. So the pol you know, our policy, policy shop really learns from uh, my colleagues who are doing the on the ground work on the ground cases. And what we're trying to do is make sure that kids are safe and treated you know, with the best possible um, consideration by the government, their best interests are taken into consideration. So I kind of call it soup to nuts. So we work on everything from the root causes, why are kids leaving in the first place and what can be done? US foreign aid and foreign policy, how can it be shaped in a way that's gonna allow kids to stay in their communities? How do we make sure kids are safe in transit? 
How do we make sure they're received well when they show up at an international border? And then how do we make sure that they get due process and their cases are fairly considered when they're at the place of their, of their destination? So our policy work really um, spans um, this whole experience of the child's migration. So we have someone on my team that focuses on US foreign aid and foreign policy. We have somebody, you know, we have a few people on our team that focus on um, US federal policy. So how is the federal government treating these kids? So that includes the reception at the border. It includes how their cases are handled in immigration court. Um, and then we also have somebody who does state and local policy. So especially during the Trump administration, when there was not much uh, proactively happening to increase protections for this population, there was a lot of um, movement and excitement from localities about how to receive these kids, make sure they're safe while they're going through the court process, and how can they ultimately be integrated into the communities here in the U.S. So we've been doing a lot more state and local policy, um, kind of like what Michael was saying, CARE has been doing. Um, and so I managed, you know, all the people who are working this, trying to make sure that we're complementing each other um, and really building off and learning from each other and learning from our colleagues who are doing the on the ground cases. Um, my journey to this position, I started as EJW fellow out of law school, um, representing trafficked children at another local NGO here in DC that does immigration work called Ayuda. Um, and I did my two year fellowship um, representing kids. I always joke, I was a real lawyer <laughs> for a couple of years before I moved into the policy realm. Um, so represented kids in their family court and immigration court cases. Um, fortunately, actually, KIND was just starting when my EJW fellowship was ending, and they had created a model in which they were going to fund fellows to work at NGOs. So I actually stayed at Ayuda as a KIND fellow, so I thought I was going to be a professional fellow <laughs> for the rest of my life. I wasn't sure when I would get out of that. Um, so I stayed on and was able to stay and spend um, several more years working on kids' cases. I got to the point where I actually started to feel a little burned out um, and felt like I wasn't maybe doing the best job I could be doing for the kids. <clears throat> so I took a sabbatical thinking maybe I just needed a break. You know, these cases were really difficult. They're very emotionally challenging. Um, so I took a break, came back, was ready to roll um, and just felt like I wasn't. Felt like I was not doing as good as a job as actually the person who replaced me when I was when I was on sabbatical. And so I thought, you know, how else can I serve this population that I you know, really grew to care deeply about? How can I continue to serve them, but in a way that's going to be better for them and better for me? So I ended up leaving and taking a job at the Women's Refugee Commission, where I got to do research and policy. So going from direct service and, and dip my toe and doing some policy work. And really loved it and having the opportunity there to do a lot of research. So travel to the border, travel to detention centers, and hear from migrants themselves about what you know are policy recommendations um, and changes that they would want to see for other people coming behind them. And then eventually there was an opportunity that came back um, at KIND's policy team to come back to KIND. And so I've been there for about almost six years now. That's great. Jen, can you? Can we dig in a little bit deeper into the actual kind of, what does the work look like, the policy work actually look like? Whether it's yours or, the, or you, know, you manage a team and your colleagues, can you just spend a couple of minutes talking about what the actual policy work looks like? Yeah, I think that's a great question because I even felt you know, going from direct service, you know, client walks in your office, you help them close the file, next client walks in, and the policy work, I was kind of like, what do I do all day? What, I, what, what is it? Where is the, so, you know. What's the yeah. it, right? What's the what, right? Exactly, right? Yeah. 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 So, yeah. you know, every day looks different, which is what I love about it. Um, there can be a whole host of activities that I'm doing during the day. Um, we do both legislative and administrative advocacy on the federal level. So administrative advocacy means engaging directly with the administration. So oftentimes it's meeting at headquarters levels, coming up with proposals that we want them to adopt. Um, and so it's a lot of writing, right? Making recommendations and really thinking through and brainstorming ideas on, okay, our clients are identifying this as a problem. What would be a workable solution? And how do we then advocate for that? Um, I'm also a registered lobbyist. So I do a lot of lobbying on the Hill, um, asking legislators to also um, implement our, uh, our recommendations through legislation and through appropriations. Um, so that's, you know, meeting with them to educate them about the issue, proposing or reviewing proposed legislation, 
um, making recommendations about the budget and how the budget could be used in a way that would increase protections for this population. Um, we do international advocacy, so that could be engaging with um, the Inter-American uh, Commission for Human Rights or the United Nations and doing meetings, and they often hold convenings and really elevating our issues um, so people are aware of it. Um, utilizing the media, so working with my communications colleagues and trying to think of how do we place op-eds, how do we educate reporters so that they are really lifting up the issues and the plight of these kids, um, and we're able to use that as a platform to talk about, to engage the public and uh, gain sympathy for this population um, and our recommendations with the American public. I think one example of, of how that was, how that worked, it was successful was during family separation. You know, under the previous administration, there was a policy that separated kids from their parents at the border. And, you know, we were spinning all our policy wheels, talking to the administration, talking to the Hill, and we're getting anywhere. And it really wasn't until there was really great media coverage about it. And the American people really spoke up and tides kind of changed that the policy was changed. Jen, you're, 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 you're freezing really a little about bit What are there. the tools you have in your toolbox and trying to utilize all of them? So one day, can you hear me now? Yes, I think so. No, you're a little, just um, a little. I was just finishing saying. Yeah, go ahead. Try it. Let's try it again. <laughs> do you want to go to someone else, Michael, and then come back to me? Sure. Let's okay. do that. Sure. Josh, well, you want to? You want to? Yeah, take I, a I just want to say something that really resonated with me that Jen was talking about. Well, one, the idea that like every day looks differently, which is another thing that I, I similarly love about the job. I've kind of always been one of those like jack of all trades types of folks. Um, kind of getting bored if I'm stuck to one thing for too long. So might have like legislative meetings one day, might be sort of looking through Twitter, seeing what that response is looking like. Um, the age of like social media now is just so powerful. And it's odd to say that I get paid sometimes to like scroll through Twitter feeds and see what's going on on a localized level or like I get to read a bunch of like news articles, which I would be doing on my spare time. So they say, do something that you love. And I get to, yeah, just read it, read a bunch of news and get on the Twitter. Um, what do you do with that information? What is that? Why is that important to your job? Yeah. I mean, you always, it, it's remarkable how some of these Twitter handles know things before anyone else does. Like, it used to be breaking news was the ticker on the bottom of like CNN. Now breaking news is literally like the amount of seconds on Twitter that someone just tweeted whatever, whether it's a journalist or like an activist. I mean, it's a really powerful app. And, you know, part of policy, right, is like you want to be ahead of the game. You want to be ahead of the curve in terms of like strategy. And so if I'm working in a state that I don't live in, let's say North Carolina, and there's a particularly popular localized Twitter handle that knows what's going on in Wilmington, like it's imperative that I, I follow them, and know what's going on. Um, yeah, so, but I, I'd love to hear, Michael, what your day to day is like. Yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of it is, is the same. I will say that as professionalized as it, as it sounds sometimes at the local level, uh, it can feel like a bit like Parks and Rec, the TV show. Uh, you know, when we are dealing with the county council members, you know, it is, it is not as easy sometimes to get folks in meetings. It's not as formal. I had a, when we were trying to get Prince George's County here in Maryland to um fund some work the county council member told me that she meets with folks at a pizza place from on fridays from noon to six and i could come and wait and that's what i did i waited till the <laughs> table was open and then we sat down and had a conversation um so yeah a lot of that we are uh, obviously following everything on twitter as well uh it seems like lately a lot of the day-to-day -day work is strategizing around who's doing what 
you know, there's a lot of organizations that are doing this work and generally collaboratively. Uh, so like, for example, we know KIND is out there doing kids advocacy work and doing it well. Um, so we're fairly comfortable there. Um, and knowing that, you know, we are one of the few groups in the country that gets funded to do mental health work with adults in detention, we get pulled into different meetings that otherwise we wouldn't be. So I feel like there's a lot of meetings with your peers. It's not just meeting with decision makers, it's meeting with other NGOs to decide, okay, we all have limited resources. None of us make what we're worth. None of us are going to be done work until 10 o'clock tonight, who's doing what? And I feel like that's a big piece of the work that I do. Um, and it's important as well, because depending on where you work and your funding streams and your mission and your board, you may be able to say things that other groups cannot and vice versa. Um, so that is an incredibly, I think, important piece of the puzzle is having those meetings. And I would imagine at least one per day. And I'd imagine Josh and Jen, it's the same, right? We, we are constantly talking to our peers. Yeah, I, you know, uh, for, for me, right, my, my work is similar to Jen's in, in my current job, but I did want to spend a couple of minutes talking about the work that I did for, you know, the better part of a couple of decades, which is, you know, policy work both in the, in the United States Senate and, and, and for the Obama administration. Um, and, you know, it's important to note, right, like, I, I got my job on the Hill because I was a lawyer, right? Um, there are, like, it, it was no question, right? I'm not, I'm not guessing at that. The senator that hired me wanted to hire a lawyer because he was a lawyer and he understood the set of skills that lawyers have. And we're going to talk about skills in a minute, but there are a ton of lawyers on Capitol Hill, both in the House and the Senate, because you're writing law. So you have to really understand how to interpret law. What does law mean? And, and there obviously are a set of skills that, that, that lawyers have that really lend itself to the work on the Hill um, in legislating. Um, you know, it, uh, and, and so I did that for, 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 for 10 years. I actually helped the senators craft and negotiate legislation around education in particular for me. And I did it for, for about 10 years. Um, when I joined the Obama administration, um, I came in as the deputy assistant secretary and then I was asked to, to leave the office of special ed as the assistant secretary. And you know that's the other side of the three sides of the coin of the federal government, but, but that's the, the, the other side is actually implementing the law that we wrote, right? And what does that look like? And how do you develop regulations? And how do you develop guidance? And how do you engage stakeholders? Because if there's anything that I've learned and my colleagues can probably attest to this, you can't do anything by yourself in Washington. You need partners and allies, whether you are the federal government or a senator or not, you need support, you need allies to get stuff done. And so, um, you know, I, I, I spent a good number of years, you know, really trying to help execute the law. Um, and again, you know, it's just worth noting, you know, I wasn't a lawyer, practicing lawyer while I was doing that work, but I worked very, very closely with the lawyers at the Department of Education who worked in the policy space, right? They were policy and legislation lawyers. So they helped provide us with the understanding of where our statutory authority existed, where it didn't, how far we could go, how far we couldn't go, what are the risks, the legal risks that we're gonna get sued or not, right? And so the lawyers play such an incredible, critical role in, in, in uh, in policy. Um, Jen, we, we, you got cut off. Was there anything else you wanted to kind of add to, to that? No, I think that was covered, but I was just reflecting on what you said about the advocates and the litigators. You know, we have a litigation team within KIND and we talk all the time and strategize, how do we play off of each other to get what we need to get? You know, could we push on the advocacy side, when do you drop litigation, when can the litigators, you know, not be involved in a conversation, but then the policy people can. And so really collaborating to get to your end goal is, has been really important. You know, you know, that's right. Like, I, I, just a quick 30 second story. We were developing a set of regulations um, that were controversial. 
and, and are controversial and remain controversial. And in fact, the Trump administration tried to overturn them, but they were pushed back by a court. My point of raising this story is that, you know, it was risky for, for the Secretary of Education and for the administration. And I had to rely on my lawyers to make sure that I was not taking a step beyond what I was statutorily author authorized to do or in any way violating the Administrative Procedures Act, right? Because that would then overturn. And I had to assure the secretary that I was not gonna put him at legal risk, right? And we were not gonna do anything in that way. And, and the, the, the epitaph to that story is the Trump administration tried to overturn it and they completely ignored the Administrative Procedure Act or, or significantly ignored it and a court overturned it, right? And, and overruled their, their, their regulations. So anyway, um, Let's, let's talk for a minute about skills. Like, what are the skills that you need to do policy as a lawyer? Um, do you need to be a specialist? Do you need to be a subject matter expert? Do you, is it okay to be a generalist? Let's, let's talk about those skills for a minute. Who wants to jump in? Yeah, I mean, I could jump in quickly. Um, you know, when I was um, attending law school, I, I took a lot of pride in being a generalist. Um, I knew that I was going to be doing juvenile work upon graduating, and juvenile justice work or youth justice work touches upon like trauma, behavioral health issues, educational issues with IEPs and learning developments. Um, and you know, I think especially like the criminal justice system, but I, I would imagine all of our jobs require this like holistic knowledge. Um, and you're learning sort of like tidbits here and tidbits there that help sort of um, guide your work. I mean, I'm no, I've studied trauma, I'm no like trauma expert, but you know, I've been able to fall back on that information when we're crafting behavioral health bills, uh, which is really important to at least have some little nugget of information on that. Um, of course, you know, all your reading and writing, but like, along with writing, you know, the sort of concise, punchy, how do I get this on like a one pager or like a tweet um, that's going to be like easily accessible to folks. And then, you know, one thing that I'll say too, sort of a, well, a, a skill set that I learned in law school through clinical work, but I think also just learning to read people's like body language and behavior. I mean, I'm in like a legislative meeting and I'm overanalyzing people like what did it mean when the that senator sort of shoulder shrugged or like furrowed his brow is that a negative is that a positive you know sometimes I'm in a room with someone who I don't ideologically align with but like I need to get you over onto my side some way or however and is that going to be a mutual interest that we have about basketball that we're going to chat about someday like or am I going to um you know, make a connection one way or the other to uh, sort of convince you that like my position is, is on the right end. Hey Josh, yeah. can, I, can I ask a question about that? Because I think what sure. you said was really important and I think it gets lost sometimes, which is how hard it can be to not go in on a moral high horse and say, I'm right, you're wrong. And if you don't agree with me a hundred percent, then you're not someone I want to talk to, right? So how, how do you deal with that? Because I'm sure Jen and I, well, I do, and I'm sure Jen does as well, right? Is getting someone even, not even on the other side of the aisle, but someone who's not that concerned or not that interested or doesn't think it's a big deal. What's your go-to moves? Yeah, you know, I really try to find what commonality that we have, but like, I'll be very blunt. I mean, oftentimes like I'm the only black man in the room, right? And so if I'm um, trying to advocate for my community and I'm advocating for a position like, and I know there's going to be some compromise, if I sort of draw a line ideologically, like I could be hurting my community or the advocacy that I wanna make for my community by sort of making this ideological, you know, line in the sand and of course everyone has their their line and where that line is and that's just a part of our work but you know i think when you're doing policy work and you're advocating on a nonpartisan basis which my organization does 
um, you have to check your ego at the door and you have to realize that like, I, it is a privilege for me to be here to advocate for my community. And I'm going to try the best of my ability to advocate in a positive manner for my community that's going to lead to, you know, positive social change. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that is so wonderfully said. Checking humility or checking your ego at the door is, is such an important thing to learn as you're, as you're going through this. Yeah, it's funny you say that, Josh, because I was thinking when Michael asked that question, I was thinking you need to be, you need tenacity and humility <laughs> for the first things I thought of and you articulated exactly why you have to do it. I mean, we always joke that we're this scrappy little team. You have to just be creative all the time. You know, one thing doesn't work. You know, if you weren't able to convince somebody the first time, how else can you do it? And we sit around and we bounce ideas off each other all the time and you have to be humble because your colleague will say to you, that's a terrible idea, <laughs> but you're always just trying to be creative and throwing things out, right? Because you're trying to get to yes, you're trying to bring people to the table because that's what's going to be best for the people um, you're advocating for. Um, so I couldn't agree more. I also think too, I mean, your question, Michael, about like being a specialist or a generalist, I have a little bit of everything on my team, you know, and sometimes it's, you know, experience working on the Hill or working at an agency that's very valuable to have that perspective. But I want that coupled with somebody who represented kids. So they have the connection to the kids and they can talk about that. Exactly right. yep. So building a team of people who actually have complementary skills, I think is really important. Absolutely. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. You know, all of that, I agree with 100%. The other thing I would add too, particularly if you're in the space of making policy, the skills that a lawyer brings to the table are really important. This is gonna sound absurd, but, and everybody learns it a different way in law school, but like the IRAC method, right? The issue, rule, application, and conclusion. I'm 30 years out of law school and I still frame <laughs> policy in that space. What's the issue? <laughs> what is the root? What are we working with? What is the application of the rule to the right? And and ultimately your conclusion. And and really that that you know right. You all know this, right? Law school breaks you down so you can think in a different way, <laughs> right? That's that's the kind of the purpose of law school is to make you think differently. And that really aligns itself very well to policy making. So. You know, I, I, we only got about 10 minutes before we open it up to Q&A, and I really wanted to spend a, a, the last few minutes before we do that talking about what should law students be doing now to prepare themselves, their careers for, uh, for work in the policy political space. Yeah, Jen, you can answer this one. <laughs> That's a tough one. That's a tough one. I was actually going to say, I don't know if I'm the right person to start because I actually, all the internships I did in law school were direct representation and I loved it. I was like, I want to be in court. I want to be working with people. I'm going to be a litigator. And I did one policy internship in law school and I was like, that's boring. <laughs> you sit in these offices in DC and you write and well, I want to get out there and be with people. I want to be in front of a judge. So I don't know if I'm the right person to know, but I do think it was great to try it because again, especially if you want to work in one certain field, you know, even though things, you know, this country seems like a big country, the communities are pretty small once you start working in a certain issue area. And so you get to know people. And so law school is the, the time where you want to try things and you might hate something, but you meet people. I still work with the people I met with during that policy internship that I didn't think I liked, right? And now I'm working with them as a policy colleague. And so trying as many things as you can in law school, you don't, you, I think having a varied background is more important than just honing in and knowing everything when you get out of law school, because everybody's going to grow and learn. Um, so that would be, that's my two cents on that one. Yeah, absolutely. And same with me, right? I didn't, I didn't think I'd be doing policy in law school, but I see the, the new laws, the new lawyers who we hire and what they bring to the table. Uh, and I'm always impressed when they not only understand the law, but, the, and, you know, the policy sphere, but numbers and finances. It's such an important part of policy work uh, and being able to crunch the numbers or speak 
about finances intelligently is incredibly important. Um, and unfortunately, and I hate to say it, but take your admin law class. I know it, it's just, Michael mentioned the APA, like it's, it's just going to enter your life and it won't ever go away. Even if you're never does, right. It yep. never does. Yep. Yeah, yep. absolutely. Yep. Yeah. I, you know, I'm glad I went third because I really didn't want to be the face of the take the admin or like <laughs> statutory analysis course. So thank you for, for jumping on that for me. Um, I'll, I'll say something a little bit differently. Um, I'm always really impressed with interns who are like up to date with news or um, what's going on politically. You know, if you're working in this sector, your sort of value that you bring to the table is information, right? And that's, that's the information that you could provide like a legislator about knowing something inside and out or some figures that's like particularly compelling. From our end too, it's also like, you know, knowing the legislator, where do they live? Like, you know, do they have kids? Are they like a certain religious denomination, sports team, sports fan? Um, you know, do they like Hamilton? Answer, probably yes. So like, I, I think just uh, reading a lot, reading a lot of the news and like, if you know right now, like I didn't necessarily know where I was going to live, but if you know that like you're from Iowa and you wanna go back to Iowa and you wanna live there, like keep up on Iowa politics, you know, all representatives from all out throughout the state, but that would also include like local representatives and people on council so that like, you know, if there's an opportunity, you can chat about them or chat with them. Um, I think that that just broad base information is is sort of where we we make our bang for the buck. You know, I, yeah. I, I, I would like to add to that, too, and, and that is the, the value of internships and fellowships. And Jen talked about that, you know, but, you know, work based learning opportunities provide you with a number of, of skills and opportunities, right? And that is to understand the work while you're an intern, while maybe somebody else is paying for you or they're not paying that much for you. Um, the fellowship route is really important. Uh, Jen, I wanna ask you to talk about the EJW fellowship in a second, but that was actually how I made my, my transition into from, from being a government lawyer to actually being a staffer on the Hill is I had a fellowship. I had applied for a fellowship program. And what that allowed was I had a set of skills that was valuable to the Hill. They didn't have to pay my salary because I was a fellow. So I was incredibly valuable or more valuable because they didn't have to pay me because the fellowship was paying me. And I was able to learn in the space and meet the, make the connections and meet the players and know that, you know what, this is what I love. I actually fell in love with it the minute I walked in the door, right? I'd never really been in politics and policymaking in that space. Um, and I was able to get a job out of it, right? Um, you know, a, a, a senator's legislative director said, what are you doing when your fellowship is ending? I was like, I guess I'm going back to my agency. They're like, no, come work with us. <laughs> and I did, and, I, and then I stayed and worked on the Hill in a variety of capacities. For, for a decade. Um, can you just spend a few minutes, Jen, talking about like EJW Fellowship and what that, how that has kind of opened doors and provides opportunities? Yeah, sure. I mean, the EJW Fellowship, it's kind of a dream, right, from a law student. You dream up a project of what you'd like to do when you're done and somebody pays you, you know, some money to do it and you get to do it all day and you get to be creative and you're adding value and something new to an organization. Um, so it's different from a staff attorney position where you're, you know, filling a specific role they need as a fellow, you're able to come in and create something new and bring something new and add a different element to the work. Um, so, you know, these kinds of fellowships are just amazing opportunities. I think it's stressful because it's time limited, right? Usually you take a job and, you know, there's not a clear end date usually. So the fellowship can be stressful in that as you're getting closer to the end of the fellowship, it's like, what are you gonna do? Can the organization keep you or not? But even in instances when the organization can't financially keep you on and create a permanent position, you have this amazing launching pad, right? Because now you have contacts, you have work experience to show, you can show you've already done this. 
you know people in the community, probably entities you'd want to work with. And so it's a very easy way to transition into a permanent job, even if you can't stay at the, the organization you did your fellowship with, like Michael did. Anyone else uh, have any, any, any thoughts on that? Well, yeah, I didn't do it. I, so my fellowship was a Zubrow fellowship with the Juvenile Law Center. And the only thing that I would add to that too is like, <clears throat> to this point that Jen was making, um, the legal community almost like gets smaller and smaller as like niche, whatever you get, right? So like you start off with like all criminal justice attorneys, but then those who work in policy, but then those who work in juvenile law, but then those who work with like life without parolers, um, and so I would just say like network, 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 like get that cross pollination going on because like, you know, if your current employer can't hold on to you for whatever reason, um, you know, you're almost assuredly going to meet a bunch of people in the space and um, just be aware that like the community is really small and um, along with your uh sort of the knowledge that you bring and the information that you bring, your reputation is, is also, you know, of, of huge importance and value. So if you can leave your last organization with like high remarks and great reviews, that's going to really be amplified throughout your uh, legal community. I, I could not agree with you more, Josh. If I had to actually say the two most valuable things are, are your reputation and your relationships. In, 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 at least in Washington, right, in, the, in, the, in this town. I continue to work with people that I worked with 20 years ago, right, when we were young staffers or younger staffers, right, um, and we're all in different positions, right? I mean, I got, my, I got confirmed by the United States Senate because I had a good relationship with a Republican staffer who was, who's another Republican office was actually blocking my confirmation, and I had to go to this Republican staffer who was no great friend of Barack Obama or Arne Duncan's for that matter. And he actually did it. He, he went and removed, got the other senator to remove the box because we had that relationship and he trusted that I would actually be good in that job, right? He trusted that I could do that job. So the relationships, and, and that's one example I could, you know, identify a thousand where relationships and, and, and your reputation is, is absolutely critical to, to, to building your career. So, you know, I want to want to kind of we got about 12 minutes left or so. So I definitely want to do Q&A and I don't know what we have in the queue. Um, before we do, Chris, I saw there was one question in the chat. It was addressed to me, but actually I think it's addressed to the other Michael because it says, at what point in your career did you get your public policy degree and to what ways did you find it most beneficial? It's not to me because I don't have a public policy degree. So it sounds like that one was to me. I yeah. got my master's. Uh, it, I got an MPM uh, about halfway through my time with Care Coalition. I, I realized pretty quickly that I was not going to be doing direct services. It was not my path. Uh, I had done you know, direct immigration work on a pro bono basis. Actually, my first case was a SIG case with Kind back when I was at a law firm. Um, but I was acutely aware that there were pockets of my education that were missing. I was a biochem major in undergrad. I went to law school. Uh, I had never taken an economics class. I had never taken a broader policy class. Um, and so I, I, I find it incredibly helpful. I rely more on that than I do on my legal background on any given day mostly because I, I don't do much legal work anymore. Um, I'm not representing clients. I'm not reading contracts. Uh, I have people to do that, right? So I, I have found my policy de degree to be the most valuable of the three degrees that I have. Thank you. Great. All right, Krista, do you wanna, thank you for, for joining us. Uh, do we have any questions uh, from folks? We do have a couple questions. The first is, I've had people tell me that I should be using my degree for legal services rather than policy work, which some think of as just JD advantage. What would you say to people like that? How has a law degree been important to your work? 
So, and I'm sorry that I'm talking twice in a row, but this question comes up sometimes. And frankly, it always bothers me when people try to gatekeep other people's passion. Um, I have a great friend from law school who never took the bar and has been working uh, in other parts of the world on women's rights as it relates to HIV and AIDS. And I think she's probably done more for the world than most people I know who are litigators. Uh, to me, get your law degree and find your passion to help the world and who cares what other people say, but I'm also pretty blunt about these things. Listen, Michael, <laughs> I think too, um, I mean, for me, having done the casework is very important and informs my advocacy, right? And the connection with kids. And so for me, it's very, it was very important to have done actually direct services work, which I needed a law degree to do. Um, I also think, you know, some, some of these circles that we have to be in to do this work are pretty cutthroat. And I have to say, as a woman, it gives you a lot of legitimacy to have a law degree. You know, I think it has helped. And so um, it's open doors or lends credibility, um, to be honest. And so I think in that way, it's helped me as well. I think also, too, like the law degree is, um, yeah, like it's, reframing the way that you think and the way that you argue and the right way that you read the way that you read other individuals like I don't think it's just a direct services or bust type of like situation I mean our the policies that we make are uh, affecting wide swaths of people and um, while I'm not like in a courtroom on a day-to-day -day basis like I'm still using my legal skills like persuasiveness, you know, I mean, obviously statutory analysis. Um, I mean, and I guess the last thing that I'll say too, like I always wanna be really connected to local work. So like I volunteer in my spare time. So like, you know, if I'm volunteering at, um, you know, a nonprofit organization helping with food or something like that, like I still feel that close community connection. So if you're ever afraid of sort of being, um, that one step to remove as you might be with policy, like there are other avenues to, to be making like a direct service impact too. It doesn't have to be an either or. Great. Next question is from David Stern, our executive director. He says, great panel. Based on my experience, some organizations have a lot more weight than others. For example, AARP. And I wonder how important it is to present a unified front, even when you have disagreements with other groups. Second, it feels like framing the issue is also critical to winning. So I, I'd like to actually take a, take the, a little bit of the first piece of that, and 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 I know Michael can do it as well. But you know, in in my job now, we help EJW actually manage a coalition to preserve and improve the public service loan forgiveness program. And, you know, we are a coalition of over 90 organizations and we were facing the elimination of this program by the Trump administration and Republicans in Congress wanted to literally eliminate the program. And the, the effectiveness of, of the coalition actually changed the outcome of that, impacted the outcome of that. We were able to call on other organizations who were allied on this issue, which is, you know, we may disagree on a thousand things, but we all can, our members can all benefit from public service loan forgiveness, and we all need to protect it. So we come together in a way that is so unbelievably significant. We were able to, to, to build some support with some Republicans, hold off on, on, on some of the really dangerous things. And now we have a friendly administration that actually does want to improve and protect the, the, the program and then we are, you know, rocking and rolling, right? We, it, it is really, really effective to have members of this coalition, not only to, to, to be a line of defense, but then to go on offense, but I'll turn it over to, to others as well. I mean, one thought about that is I think that sometimes it's important to not wait until everyone's aligned as well. Like I can't, 
you know, I, I can't overemphasize how important that kind of coalition work is in the strange bedfellows situation where you get parties who have different influence coming together to advocate together for something's very important. But I also think sometimes too, you're gonna be in situations where there is disagreement amongst advocates on a certain issue that are otherwise typically aligned and to be comfortable with that. It's okay because it can be helpful to the eventual winning of what you wanna get, right? If you can say, okay, some groups are grassroots groups and what they do is they organize, they do protests, they do, you know, they'll get the media coverage on this. Then you might have another group that's a little bit more in the middle and they wanna, you know, kind of be at the table negotiating things, right? And there's the, the other group that's going to be doing the litigation piece of it and being okay with the differences and distinctions, um, because sometimes otherwise you can get paralyzed with waiting to try to come to agreement on one thing. So I actually think having different positions can be advantageous, um, but absolutely agree with Michael that kind of the strange bedfellows coalitions are just really incredibly effective. Great. Two more questions. From your experiences, how necessary is an MBA in public policy to work in policy if one already has a law degree? I mean, my initial response is I don't think it is. Uh, I don't know if Jen and Josh agree, but most of the folks in my world who I learn from and look up to and I think drive these conversations do not have either of those degrees. It was helpful for me, for sure. Uh, but I also think that if I had a different undergraduate and different career path, it would have been a totally different situation for me. I don't think I've, I haven't been introduced to someone in my workspace who has an MB, MBA. Um, I think if you have a law degree, you, are, you have the like skill sets that you, that you would need. I don't know yet. I actually just hired someone on my team who's about to start, who just um, ended up having worked as a paralegal and then getting a policy degree. And I think we're all really excited for some of her um, uh, quantitative analysis skills that we don't have, us lawyers don't have on the team, um, but to be continued, I guess. <laughs> the, the only other thing I would add to that is I might take a little bit of a different path and, and say, you know, at the end of the day, if you, if you want to get into policy work, right, and, and build a career in it, right, understanding the kind of the fundamentals of how an organization works, how you build, you know, the financial, right, you know, becoming a COO or actually starting your own nonprofit organization is absolutely a set of skills that I so clearly do not have. You know, I work at a, at, a, at a public affairs firm and we all do advocacy and, and progressive so work on social justice issues, um, but I wouldn't begin to know how to operate a firm like this, no less a nonprofit and understand 501c3 and taxes and all the things that come along. And so, there, I, you know, I think there, there certainly could be valued. It clearly depends on the path you want to go. Great, and last question. Is it important to practice law and do direct services at the start of your career before going into policy work? Are there any drawbacks to going straight into policy if you know that's what you're interested in? I think we, we kind of touched on this a bit. Um, again, my, I mean, setting aside what you should do, I mean, I think there's definitely advantages to knowing how the policies impact the people you're trying to help. Um, but again, it's um, also going to depend on the jobs that you find when you come out of school, which leads me back to the, you know, what we were saying earlier, which is like, check out the fellowships, find ways to follow your passion. You know, when Josh, so I don't want to speak for you, so you speak it, but you, you, you touched on that, right? Like you didn't want to be a public defender to just get yourself to doing something else, right? Yeah, like I just, I really don't think, and worked out for me, so, you know, sample size of one, but like, I just don't think you should make your life decisions based on like the suggestions of what other folks are trying to suggest basically like if you know you want to do policy like find a way do policy and 
I mean, everyone has to put bread on the table. So, you know, if the stars don't align and you can't find a policy opportunity, you know, there are always other routes and fallbacks. But if you know you want to do policy, then, you know, why settle? Go, you know, go as hard as you can and trying to get that job and hopefully it'll all work out. Great. Well, it is it is time, right? Um, I want to thank everyone. Thank you, Christopher, for fielding those questions, and Jen and Josh and Michael. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. I hope this was a a good use of everybody's time. Thank you all for 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 paying attention and joining us, and uh, look forward to seeing you in the policy space. Thank you very thank much, you, to all our panelists, for participating in today's session. We hope you enjoyed it. The recording of this session will be available for all of you to listen to starting tomorrow. You can access the recording by coming back to this page on Possible. We also want to thank our conference sponsor, Idealist, for helping make this year's conference and career fair possible. If you haven't already, we encourage you to listen to our community of impact, a conversation with Amit Dar and David Stern, where Amy Dar, founder and executive director of Idealist, shares with us his insights on both starting and maintaining a public interest career. And finally, if you have any questions about this year's fair or how Equal Justice Works can help you launch your public interest career, come speak with one of our representatives from 12 to 6 Eastern time today. You can find us by searching for Equal Justice Works under the Organizations tab. We hope that you enjoy the rest of the conference and have a great day all. Thank you. See you all.